Good morning to everyone. Myself, Shaul Amit. In this video, we are going to continue our discussion about testing. In particular, we will be discussing about validation testing and debugging. The contents of this video classes are taken from this book. I suggest you to read out the original sources for a better understanding. Let us see validation testing in detail in this slide. Validation is done after unit and integration testing are performed. Okay, once unit and integration testing are performed, then naturally people will go for validation testing. Validation is the act of declaring something is valid or officially acceptable. In our context, something can be declared as valid or acceptable only if the end user, that is the customer, is satisfied with the software. If the customer is satisfied with the, uh, with the software, then we can declare that the software is valid or acceptable. This is why validation testing is also called as acceptance testing. Both validation and acceptance testing are almost similar. Okay, now how do you ensure that the customer is indeed satisfied with the software? This is where validation testing comes into play. Validation testing comprises various strategies of testing involving the, involving the customer or the client directly or indirectly to validate the software under test. Okay, that is the validation testing comprises of various strategies which either involves the client directly or indirectly. Okay, the client is involved for sure, but he can be involved directly or indirectly to validate the software. So essentially validation testing strategies can be divided into two types in which the customers are directly involved in the testing process and the second type in which the customers are not directly involved. In the second type, that is where the customers are not directly involved, in the second type we use the SRS document which hopefully has captured the requirements of the customer in a systematic manner. This, this SRS is used as a reference document to validate the software. Okay, here we are indirectly uh, here we are not directly dealing with the customer, rather the requirement document which uh, which have been made from the customer, which uh, which uh, the requirements obtained from the customer are document as SRS document and this document is used to um, test the software or to validate the software. So this is the second type. Uh, here we test to check that the software, uh, here we test to check that the software reasonably satisfy the user requirement mentioned in the SRS document. That is the software should reasonably satisfy the requirements mentioned in the SRS document. In the, in the next slide, let us see in detail how the validation testing is done in the context of the SRS document. A series of tests is designed to check whether the software which has been built does actually satisfy the customer requirements. So test cases should be specifically designed to check each and every requirement mentioned in the SRS document. Especially the test cases should test the functional requirements. To be specific, what aspect of the software is tested? Uh, it, uh, it can be seen from the slide that the content, uh, that is the UI of the software is properly presented, should be properly presented. The software should have good performance, that is should be reasonably fast and robust. Note that documentation is mentioned here. This is because validation testing, as I said, aims to make sure that the customer is satisfied with the software product. Good documentation is essential for a customer to use the software in a better way. So that is why documentation uh, is mentioned here. Finally, other features like portability, recoverability, and things like, um, and similar things are also tested. If the software does not meet the specified requirement, that is, if it deviates from the specification, those deviations are separately marked down or recorded in what is known as a deficiency list. Later, the issues in the deficiency list will be captured by the developers. Now, let us see the other form of validation testing, which directly involves the customer. As shown in this slide, it is nearly impossible to validate a software just from the SRS document. Customer generally comes with varied knowledge and tends to use the software in a strikingly different ways, which as a developer you might not even have imagined. Uh, different customer can use the software in a different way. Some of them can use it in a very weird way, which you you would not have even imagined. So it is necessary. So it is necessary to actually bring in the customer themselves into the testing process. You bring in into the loop of testing so that uh, you could better test the software. Um, just like your placement drive. We uh, test um, software testers conduct a test drive. Okay, a test drive is conducted where the customers are provided with the software and asked to use it. Okay, the customers are asked to use the software which you have been developed and simultaneously report things which they don't like or find faulty in that software. Okay, the customer themselves are asked to report things which they don't like or find faulty. 
Technically, two approaches exist for this type of validation test, which directly involves the customer. They are namely alpha and beta testing. Let us see them in detail in the next slide. First, let us see about alpha testing. In alpha testing, a group of users or customers will be called to the developer's office and will be asked to test the software. Okay, the customers will be called to the developer's site and we will ask the developers, sorry, we will ask the customers to test the software. Informally, the tester or the developer will look over the shoulder of the customer as they use the software. Okay, looking over the shoulder uh, shown in the image and will try to find errors. Okay, thus alpha test is conducted in a systematic manner by the developers by overseeing the way in which the users use this system. Okay, whereas beta test on the other hand is conducted at the user site. Typically, beta testing is employed in situations where the number of users is very high and varied. Typically, software products which will be used by the general public will be subjected to beta testing. Other apps, websites are typically beta tested. Here, the developer won't be present with the client. If you note anti apps and websites, uh, they are meant for general public and it can be used by different people with different mindsets and uh, knowledge set. So in that case, uh, beta testing is recommended. Uh, in beta testing, the developer won't be present with the client. The developer won't be overseeing what is happening, how the client is using the software. Uh, this is why beta testing is called as live testing, where you actually deploy the software uh, into the environment where it will be used. Okay. Customers will use the software product and will report the errors and problems they face. Okay, you could have seen the beta version of YouTube and uh, Google Chrome Server Apps and you will have provisions to report errors so that the developers uh, can rectify them. The reported problems will be collected and appropriate actions or modification will be made by the developer to improve the quality of the software product. This is alpha testing and beta testing. Okay, now let us briefly see what is system testing. System testing is also typically conducted after the unit testing and integration testing has been done. But unlike validation testing, system testing uh, is done within the organization or within the IT industry or within uh, by the developer themselves. As discussed earlier, a software is not a standalone product. Rather, a software product is supposed to work as a part of the system. The most obvious example here is any software needs an operating system like Windows or, or Linux to function. That is, for a software to function, you may need other supporting softwares like libraries, operating systems and similar things. All these things, the, the libraries, um, the operating system together forms a system. In system testing, we test out whether the software product uh, on how well it integrates with the system and on, on, on how well it performs within the system. Okay, as a whole, how it how well it suits with the system. Okay, one typical behavior found at this stage of testing is if something is not working, developer will blame the other party. For example, if your software is not handling the network calls properly, the developer may blame the underlying operating system. He may simply declare that the Ubuntu OS is not properly handling the network calls. Okay, this kind of Activity um, is called as finger pointing the error towards the OS. Here, the developer is essentially pointing out the error is on the OS. Okay, this is called as finger pointing informally. This form of escapism will simply delay the development and should be avoided. This is a form of escapism, pointing out uh, uh, other person or other party instead of correcting your own error. Okay, to avoid this finger pointing, we need a systematic guideline to perform system testing. The guidelines given in your book is shown in this slide. You can read it out. This slide lists out the various types of system testing. Most of them are tests uh, with very clear and straightforward objective. For example, in security testing, you test how secure the software is and how the information is stored and handled in the context of security. I suggest you to read the book once to understand all these types of system testing since they are quite forward, quite straightforward. Now we come to the last part of testing. Till now, we only discuss about how to detect errors. Testing is the process of simply detecting and tracing errors in your code. What is the point of detecting mistakes if you are not going to correct them? Debugging is the process of correcting the errors you found during testing. Debugging is the remedial action you take to fix the errors and faults discovered during the testing phase. Okay. The main challenge with debugging is the remedial action or the correction you make should not introduce any new errors. Okay, the correction you should you make should not introduce any new errors. You would have noted in your experience 
uh, in your previous lab maybe that fixing one error in a code sometimes will cause several more errors this is pretty common this is a challenge this is the reason why debugging is sometimes called as an art this is an art because you should have the, you should have the knack to figure out what to now cause the error in the first place um, testing simply records error or faulty symptoms in essence any misbehavior or symptoms caused by the system is recorded but testing doesn't really care about what is the reason behind the misbehavior you should have the knack to figure out what might be the reason behind the symptom or the misbehavior or the error or fault okay it is you who is supposed to figure out what is the cause of the bug once the cause is figured out then you are supposed to correct it with minimal damage to the software this part is very important you are supposed to correct it with minimal damage to the software you should not introduce any new errors so essentially the three steps of detecting the uh, the three steps of debugging are detecting the error which is a consequence of testing followed by figuring out what caused the error this is an important part and finally fixing the error is the process of debugging in this slide let us see how errors or faults or misbehavior or to say simply symptoms can be deceiving okay how errors can be deceiving let us see this law in this slide a error occurring at one place might actually be due to a wrong code at an entirely different place okay this is one simple one single case your textbook lists out several points regarding how errors could be deceiving and you should be aware of these these points i recommend you to read out these points in this slide let us see various debugging tactics used in the it industry the first debugging tactics or strategy is brute force debugging this is one of the least efficient but sadly the most often used debugging approach if you are not able to logically or cleverly trace out the cause of an error you resort to the brute force approach here we simply pull out all kinds of information like memory dump memory dump runtime runtime traces stack trace etc and hope that somewhere among this huge pile of information you would hopefully end up figuring out figuring out the reason or the cause behind an bug and would eventually be able to solve it you simply take out all kind of information regarding the error and try to figure out from a, from the huge pile of information what could have caused the error this is called a, this is called as brute force approach which is a very slow and least efficient approach uh, it doesn't involve any cleverness or logicness you simply take out all possible information and try to brute force it try to find out the reason by looking through the uh, the pile of information okay the next tactic or strategy is backtracking backtracking is a more systematic and logical approach which you yourself would have probably used during your programming classes here we simply trace back the code manually from the part where the error had occurred to find the cause this will work only if the program is small and manageable and if the number of lines of code increases backtracking becomes practically infeasible you won't be able to trace back the error manually this is a manual process so in real application it would be difficult to uh, use this tactic the last approach is uh, is called as cause elimination uh, which is an induction or deduction based approach here we hypothesis a cause okay we hypothesis is nothing but in simple terms is a guess you make hypothesis is equal to a guess you make towards uh, a guess towards what might be the cause okay you make a guess towards what might be the cause once you hypothesis a cause you use this information uh, you use the information from the bugs or fault to either prove or disprove the hypothesis okay you you make a guess regarding what would have caused the what would have caused the error and then based on information about the error you try to either prove the uh, guess you made or disprove the guess you made in in this way you will be able to figure out what would have caused the error this is cause elimination approach as i said earlier in cause elimination approach you can make multiple guesses okay it is not necessary to come up with only a single hypothesis you can come with multiple um, hypothesis or guess regarding what could have uh, caused this error okay you can make multiple guesses regarding what could have been the cause and then eliminate one after the another the guesses you have made the multiple guesses you have made can be eliminated one after the another and what remains at last should be the best guess you made and hopefully the real cause okay this is how um the cause elimination approach works you make uh, multiple guesses about the causes and then you eliminate one after the another and what remains at the last should be the um, real cause hopefully
with this we end the discussion on this unit of software testing i recommend you to read out the testing chapter from the software engineering book by pressman and maxim uh, testing chapter is chapter number 2022 uh, it is named as software testing strategies um, please post your doubts on the comment section in the google classroom thank you